really excited to be here today to share with you all incident reproduction and playbook validation with chaos engineering. Learning from history, getting an A by going back in time. So who are we? I'm Tammy Budo, I'm a principal SRE at Gremlin. I get to do a lot of cool stuff like running game days, which is actually using Gremlin on Gremlin um, with our entire engineering team, which Anna spoke about a little bit earlier. That's super cool, get to do a lot of interesting stuff. Before that, I worked at Dropbox as well as an SRE manager on databases and block storage, and I worked at DigitalOcean before that with Bobby. And my name is Bobby. People like to call me Bobby Tables, if you're familiar with the XKCD comic. My name is also Robert Ross, so if you want to call me Bob Ross, both are acceptable. <laughs> uh, I am the CEO of Fire Hydrant, an incident response tool, firehydrant.io. Before that, I worked at Namely. I was an on-call engineer, uh, causing chaos accidentally a lot of the time. And before that, I worked at DigitalOcean, where I had the pleasure of working with uh, Tammy. So. Who is better at going back in time and learning than these two? Shout out their names if you know who they are. Woo! <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, everyone. If you don't know who they are, this is Bill and Ted from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and they're two near-miss high school dropouts who go back in time to learn from various experts in the past to be able to bring that information to the future and pass an exam. So? Bob and Tam's chaotic adventure. <laughs> All right, welcome to Feb 28, 2017, where, where our adventure begins. It was a peaceful morning, similar to today. Somewhere near Seattle, probably. Some engineer somewhere was typing in this command, S3, what could happen, dot sh. Some are 1,000, dramatization added for effect. And then the internet started experiencing some problems and some very things, uh, of curious things afoot at the Circle K. We, Trello, Slack, Quora, to name a few, started experiencing issues. Media outlets started picking it up. And this started happening. While companies around the world were updating their status page, this tweet was posted by AWS. The way that the AWS status page was actually built meant that it had a dependency on S3 in specifically US East 1, which was having an issue. So the status page was not possible to get updated. And the dashboard not changing color is related to the S3 issue is what was posted. See the banner instead at the top of the dashboard for updates. Ugh. So tweets like this started to appear. And this is like a small example of the impact of US East 1 being down. Please, all my marketing goes through Amazon Web Services. We're losing more than $1,500 each hour. Then engineers started to recommend that AWS does some chaos engineering, which is cool, <laughs> we're here at ChaosCon a few years later. I thought it'd be interesting to actually look through the postmortem report um, because they actually have a lot of information here. This was collected by Rich Burrows on our team. So we have 12.26 p.m. PST. The index subsystem had activated enough capacity to begin servicing S3 get list and delete requests. Then we have a big jump, almost an hour later, 1.18 p.m. PST, index subsystem has fully recovered, then even more time, up to 1.54 p.m., placement subsystem has fully recovered, and then some time after 1.54, not really sure, but I do know from when I was working on this incident, I was actually the incident manager on call at Dropbox during the time, so I was responsible for anything that was impacted by US East 1 being down, which actually ended up being um, thumbnails on dropbox.com. That was a hard one to figure out, but we fixed it. Uh, it was actually a five hour outage in total. So pretty big one. And then many issues happened, many systems were impacted. Let's have a look at that. We can actually get that from the postmortem report. So S3 APIs were unavailable in US East 1. The AWS Service Health Dashboard was impacted. The S3 console was impacted. You couldn't actually go and load it to even see what was happening. EC2 instances were not able to be created or launched because there was a dependency on S3. EBS volumes were also impacted. 
and Lambda was impacted. So this is just a few of the things that were impacted just by US East 1 being down. So what was the impact for us at Gremlin at the time? Well, actually, the way that we'd built Gremlin, uh, our entire marketing site and our application were wholly inaccessible since they were built as static sites hosted out of S3 and fronted by CloudFront, and they were in US East 1. So no one was able to use the Gremlin product at all by the web application for the entire outage. That's pretty bad. And Namely was also a bit in this. All the profile images were actually served through a Ruby on Rails application to do some simple resizing. But when the S3 went down, the Rails application was unable to retrieve the images and started timing out and actually created a request backlog that eventually tipped over and the entire thing went down. Don't get bitten twice, though. Whoa. <laughs> so, right now, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back, in back to the future and learn use what we learned, Tam. Yep, it's gonna be exciting. So, who here remembers the S3 outage? Put your hand up if you remember it. All right, keep your hand up if you were impacted by the S3 outage. All right, still quite a lot of hands. Put, keep your hand up if you were paged because of the S3 outage and it broke something. Okay, a few people, there's still quite a lot of people. All right. So yes, let's do it. Let's do it. We really need to get an A. Sounds like <laughs> it's incident reproduction time, Tan. All right. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to reproduce the S3 outage of 2017 using Gremlin. So it's possible for us to do this, which is pretty cool. So let's take what we learned from 2017 and now go to today, 2019, September 26. Today, everyone here and everyone on the live, streams, live stream works at chaosconfmisfits.com. You'll see everything's okay with our application. Images, assets are loading. We're all, we've got happy customers. You can easily browse what kind of misfit you might like to adopt. You know what you're getting yourself into if you bring one home. Everything looks like it's going pretty good. And just an FYI too, this is an AWS sample app called the Microservices Demo Application, and it was built by AWS. So you can actually grab it on GitHub. It was created in Python, Go, and Java. If you go to github.com slash AWS dash samples, you'll find it. But yeah, we'll share the link later. So you can play around with this at home too later and at work. So this is the recommended architecture that Amazon explains that you should use when you start to use their sample application. Let's have a look and see if we can identify any issues based on what we learned from going back in time as Bob and Tam. Okay, so let's see. If we have the US East one outage again, the sample site tells us that we should create an S3 bucket in US East one, uh-oh, um, and just create one bucket. And it also tells us that we should store our index.html file, our CSS file, and all of our images in our one S3 bucket in US East one. It's probably fine. <laughs> it's probably gonna be fine. <laughs> All right, so this is before the US East one outage. What happens next? Hmm, it's not gonna work at all. If that outage happened again, we would just have nothing. Nothing would load, nothing would be available, no index page, no CSS page, no images, not very good graceful degradation. We also wouldn't be able to get to the AWS console, like I mentioned before. It would look something like this. So that doesn't seem very good. We can do better. Let's get reliable. All righty, so this is where we started um, with the example of how we should build our site. We can do better, though. So let's think about adding some elastic load balancing, and we're also going to use EC2 for our index page and our CSS page with some auto scaling. We're also gonna use Gremlin, and then we'll be having an S3 bucket in US East 1, because we wanna gradually iterate and improve. We're gonna try it out, and that bucket will store our images. So let's see how we go. All righty, here's our site before. 
We can scroll through and see what we have. What we're going to do is we're going to use Gremlin scenarios. There's actually a recommended scenario called unavailable dependency, and it comes uh, with scenarios out of the box. So you can just click on scenarios and try this one out. Because of the way our applications are built these days, microservice applications have so many dependencies, and usually, actually, everything kind of needs to work for you to have a good experience unless you think about graceful degradation and really plan for it. So you can have a lot of issues. So when we run this scenario where we're going to, say, make US East 1 unavailable, what we want to do is think about what our hypothesis is. So this is really important. We're going to be saying, well, when our dependency is unavailable, maybe we think that the images won't load, but index and CSS page should load. So here we select the host. We're going to do a black hole attack. And we're going to select network black hole. 300 seconds, and I'm choosing here S3 US East 1. So that's in the providers section. That enables me to actually black hole everything. And I just click Run Scenario. That's it. All right. So now we get to this page where it says the scenario is set up. And on this page here, you can see a nice calendar that gives you all your data from the past of scenarios you've run. As we scroll down later, we'll be able to fill in our results, our notes and observations, if we got what we expected. And you can see here all the information. This is handy for when somebody else comes along and wants to know what scenarios you've been running. So let's see what happens when it's now running. All righty. So it looks a little bit better than before. Our index page loads. Our CSS page loads. But we don't have any images. So there are no images available at all. So we don't really know what misfit we're adopting. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into if we actually selected one of them. So that's not too good. We could definitely do better than this as well. But what we want to do, since we're doing this iterative approach, is scroll down and actually store our details in this section in the results. And we're going to say, our images didn't load. It's kind of what we expected to happen. So we click expected and incident detected. And we can just type it in here. So that's how we do our scenario. All righty. So what else could we do to make it even more reliable after this? Well, we could think about adding an additional S3 bucket. S3 enables you to turn on S3 replication, and then you can have a bucket that you can fail over to in a different region. So we could have a bucket in, say, US West 1. It's also important to think about what other areas of your architecture are you using S3 buckets. In this example, we're using it for enriched click data, too. So we better not forget about that. But there are so many things you can do to actually improve your reliability. And it doesn't take a lot of work, so it's definitely worth it. We could do S3 bucket replication, like I mentioned, S3 bucket failover. We could think about multi-cloud storage. We could also look at using a CDN. We could think about multi-cloud CDN. We could look into origin shields, which are also really cool, enable you to easily use multi-CDNs. And we could also do something where we handle image failure on the front end using React, which is a really cool thing to chat to your front end team about. Yeah. So what about playbooks, though? One thing about breaking things on purpose in chaos engineering is that it's not just for software. You can use the same principles of chaos engineering to validate things in your processes. You can use it to identify gaps in knowledge. You can use it to also onboard people. And with playbooks, what they are is they write down the steps necessary to complete certain tasks. For example, how many people in your organization know how to update your status page during an incident? And there's a couple of ways that you can do this. And one of the ways that you can do and check if this process works, or if you have a lack of a process, is to do a surprise meeting which was what I did to my coworker. <laughs> That's my coworker. Yeah, click once more. Yep. Oh, there okay, we go. so I have Dylan here. I scheduled a surprise meeting for uh, he and I. And Dylan, what I would like you to do is pretend there is a SEV1 incident for Fire Hydrant and update our status page. Okay, great. So I'm going to go to status page IO. And I'm not logged in because only Bobby has credentials for status pages. <laughs> <laughs> 
and now I'm stuck and don't know what to do. <laughs> That's not very good. Help. <laughs> what would you? I'm going to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> From my slack. Yep. So this is really impacting the TV. Myself myself out there. And say, I please need the status page credentials. I please need. <laughs> hey, it's a sev one. Grammar's out the door. <laughs> Help me now. <laughs> okay, so you need a, an account. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of dub the water. <laughs> So pretty quickly, we identified that if I was unavailable and we had an incident, that we would not be able to adequately tell our customers about this incident because nobody else knew how to update our status page. And tools can actually help guide us through these problems and help with by creating playbooks uh, and storing inside something like Fire Hydrant. And one thing I'll say about playbooks is that they should guide, not prescribe. They should be something that helps you, but doesn't tell you what to do. So what we've built is we've built the ability to actually store what we call runbooks in Fire Hydrant. And in this, we're able to define our standard process for a SEV2 and attach it to our incident. Inside of our tool, we can say, post a status page. Or if you would like, you can include something that says, keep calm and have agency to remind your teams that you have agency in during an incident. Playbooks can help remind your engineers that they, are, they have the ability to do what needs to be done to resolve incidents too. So lessons learned by Bob and Tam, our top three. Alrighty, first one. It's really good to reproduce your incidents using chaos engineering. This helps you ensure that they don't happen again, which is actually possible one of the best questions I've ever heard in a post-mortem meeting was, how do we make sure that this never happens again? And this is you know, the example of an incident that can continuously happen again would be, for example, a batch job always hitting the database at Tuesday night at like 10 p.m. It's always the same one over and over and over, but it never gets fixed. So how do we make sure it never happens again? Playbooks need to be validated. You can't write something, put it in Confluence, expect, and expect it to work. You have to practice the playbook, e.g., how to update your status page. The next thing you want to do is test your system and your team's processes. If you don't have a process, then you probably have a hidden process. Like we saw with the status page example, it's hard to know what to do if nobody ever tells you. And if the word process scares your team, use the words team traditions instead. <laughs> Something that Tammy was telling me that she impl <laughs> implemented at Dropbox. Yeah, I actually did do this, because whenever I would say, oh, we need to probably fix this process, everyone just run out of the building. Like, what? OK, guys. <laughs> OK, everybody, come back in. Let's talk about this. But I realize, you know, when you think about it as traditions, that makes a lot of sense. Like, Think about your family and like favorite traditions you might have, say, in America for Thanksgiving. There are certain foods you love to eat. Um, the same thing happens at work. There are certain traditions that we do that actually we enjoy, and it helps us work better together. And with that, thank you. Thanks so much.